Hello. Today, for the first time, Water Meets Sky, you'll be witnessing the first encounter between the first two artists on Science Gallery Venice's Earth, Water, Sky Environmental Science and Arts programme. The underwater artist Emma Critchley won the first open call in 2019, which was dedicated to water. She was selected to work with Professor Carlo Babanti and his team on the Ice Memory Project, which seeks to make a library of frozen water from non-polar regions in Antarctica to record climate change. Emma is currently working on making a piece inspired by her residency, which she carried out last year, and it will be shown during the Venice Biennale in 2021. This year, the multidisciplinary artist Hasib Ahmed, who works in many different modalities, from architecture, performance, sculpture, film, for example, won the second open call dedicated to Sky. He was selected to work with the Professor of Global History and Science of Wind, Professor Craig Martin here at Kafoskri University. Asib is due to begin his residency physically in person in October, hopefully, but has begun his residency virtually already with conversations with Professor Martin. So now for the first time, these two artists in residence are going to encounter each other in this virtual space as water makes way for sky. Let's see what happens and what we can learn about each of their practices. But just before we get there, I want to say a big thank you to Fondation Didier and Martin Prima for funding of the Science Gallery Venice Earth Water Sky Programme in this incredible city of Venice, which exists literally on the edge of earth, water and sky and embodies the climate and cultural challenges which we're now facing in the world. But now let's learn about water and sky. Hello, my name's Emma Critchley and I work predominantly with and underwater using film, sound, installation and photography. I'm Hasib Ahmed, uh, an artist from the US with the Dane working in Brussels and uh, I work with the wind, but uh, that often involves many different apparatuses to kind of give it form and to see it. Why are you fascinated by water, Emma? So I'm fascinated by water for many different reasons. Um, one is thinking about is the fact that it's a medium that enables us to really think about our relationship with the environment. So thinking about being underwater itself as a, as a human, uh, the density of the space really brings to the fore the fact that we in, we're inhabiting the space all the time. So when we're out of water, we're in air and we have this symbiotic relationship with the space that we inhabit. So what we do affects our environment and vice versa, the, envir the environment affects us. But um, underwater, I'm just really interested in using it as a space to enable to reflect on, on this relationship. Um, but I'm also really interested in water as a body that moves without boundaries or borders um, and thinking about it as a membrane that connects countries, continents, people, but it also conceals. So underneath this, this membrane is a wealth of natural life that we know very little about, uh, which is incredible in itself. Um, but also there's a lot of politics and history that's, that's concealed. There's a lot of activity that goes on underneath this membrane um, of the water surface that I'm really interested in. So I just find it a really rich area um, to explore. So, Hasib, why are you fascinated by wind? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, th I think I can resonate a lot with what Emma just said. Um, his uh, wind uh, or air like water is another fluid medium. And uh, in a fundamental sense, uh, all life exists within this thin layer of atmosphere. So without this sort of, um, uh, without this medium, there would be nothing else to really speak of, let's say. Uh, but in its movement, I'm really interested in the par particles and also the particular particular narratives which are carried by the wind. Uh, I think there's a way in which uh, 
these movements of this global network of of the wind maps onto uh, or can become an analog for um, uh, political narratives as well. So, for instance, uh, at the Earth, Water, Sky residency, I'm interested in the Shiroko wind, which is a uh, Saharan wind uh, moving across the Mediterranean into southern Europe. And this already starts to take on a, a, a kind of an uh, allegorical quality. Uh, so I think that it offers, in a way, it's hard to give it form. It's something very slippery. Um, but in this kind of uh, ingraspable or f uh, indefinite quality, it uh, it lends itself to new perspectives uh, on um, different phenomena that we that we inhabit in society and culture and politics as well. And and also that that's been the case throughout for for thousands of of years. So when you when you work with the wind, you can make recourse to. Uh, creation myths from Babylonia to um, and and uh, the Old Testament all the way until uh, the present and looking at uh, associations of the wind in in film and theater uh, as well. So, how is your residency uh, deepening your interests in your subject, Emma? So, um, yeah, the residencies expanding this interest um there's yeah it's really interesting the synergies actually in, in what we're exploring Hesse because for me one of the first things that I was shown by Professor Carlo Barbante is this earth movement animation that uh shows how particulates are moved around with air and water around the globe and massively interested me from from the outset so um and that's something like he described was, you know, with the ice cores is how toxins from a mine in Chile can end up in a glacier and therefore ice core in Antarctica. So um, that's something that's kind of like the, the core premise, I guess, of the work that I'm exploring in a very different way. But it's, it's just really interesting how there's, there's these real synergies. Um, so it's, yeah, thinking about this notion of global interconnectivity and, and movement, really. Um, but thinking about it in a in a in a very different way, um, in terms of of global movements, that's something that I've I've not explored before. So yeah, yeah, I I think um, for me, like I, I've worked with the wind uh, until now. Um, I was looking at the relationship between um, understandings understandings of the wind in mythology and also how uh, it's uh, how. Uh, it's also employed in technology um, and how these two kind of can infect, infect one another. Um, how we study the wind by isolating it and making it observable in wind tunnels. And so this was sort of uh, had a scalar relationship that was happening uh, between um, nature, which is outside uh, and atmospheric phenomena that you experience one to one and which you then reproduce at a much smaller scale within a completely controlled environment of, of a wind tunnel and in a lab. Uh, and this uh, nonlinear scaling, because as we know with fluids, things uh, scale in a kind of nonlinear way, uh, because there's a fixed density, and every uh, every entity experiences uh, wind and also water in different ways, depending how how big or how small you might be. Which for me is already something interesting that well, different realities exist at at these different scales. Uh, but in any case, like um, what was interesting for me with the residency was to maybe move towards um, trying to maintain that one-to-one -one quality, uh, or at least um, employing the body as as a, the primary uh, mode of observation. So not necessarily only something for for the eyes or. Uh, something to be measured within a within a wind tunnel at a much smaller scale, but rather um, approximating these global movements with with the body itself and and working at a larger scale of geography to the scale of the city to the scale of the body uh, versus um, which is a very different regime than I had worked with previously and and um, yeah I think that. Uh, What's amazing also is the case of Venice in this in this sense and how much the city itself lends itself to uh, working with the wind because they're uh, working with Craig Martin, for example, our conversations have already uh, kind of uh, touched on the way in which the city dealt with the plagues in 1542 and uh, 
um, and and uh, before that and how there how multiple how many of these medical treatises involved uh, discussions about wind and ventilation within architecture um, because it was often thought that uh, um, it, there's already a sense that uh, the movement of these foods is affecting um, health. So um, when to open what windows in your house. Uh, also trying to build structures in the Dolomites that might block certain winds from coming down from the mountains into the city. Um, and so in a way the city itself is already a kind of staging for the wind. And uh, that's something that I'm really excited to kind of um, uh, to work with also as uh, with these precedents in that sense. So that's that's really interesting because one of my questions um, from looking at your previous work is have you actually worked with the body, the human body itself? Um, because because when I think about wind, I think about it in a very haptic way about like sense and touch um, on this one to one scale. Um, so it's really interesting thinking or knowing that that's that's the way you're thinking for the work that you're developing here so i was going to ask you whether you've worked in that that way before <laughs> um but it's sort of like the work that i've that i'm kind of developing like it my work generally kind of comes from this really experiential position so i often work with people with the body over a long period of time and it's about you know our experience their experience i'm often in the water when i'm working uh, with them so we so we go through an experience together and that very much feeds into the work um, and the the pool that we've been working in Y40 is like the deepest indoor pool of the world but it is like a core so thinking about architecture it's thinking about uh, water as a body and this body of water um, that we're, we're working in so it's like yeah th this ice core that we're kind of in, inhabiting or moving within um, so there's, yeah, there's just really interesting um, synergies, especially in the way that we're talking about the subjects, I think, which is what's really interesting. Because if you look at the, the works, they look really quite different. I always find that really fascinating. <laughs> when you, the, in the conversations and the language and the descriptions, there's, there's a lot of, of synergies in the way, ways of thinking. So how, how are you thinking of, of working on this one-to-one -one scale with the body? Yeah, I think you raised uh, a, a number of good points. I, I think, um, well, for me, like I, I am, um, I think there are many things which are carried by the wind. Uh, so like uh, what's reverberating in this fluid medium is also sound, is smell. Uh, and um, and uh, also I'm very interested in the vestibular system, the inner ear system, which is like also one of the senses, but not one of the five senses that we're taught from an early age are like kind of the only senses. Uh, but, uh, and I think this might be something that you, you've also have more, have, have worked with, I suspect as well, which is uh, what gives us our sense of orientation, our sense of balance. And, and, um, and this is conditioned by, or relies on a consistent pressure uh, which also relates to to wind, um, uh, or or other fluid medium, maybe water as well. So, um, in that sense, there's. Um, I think this is. I'm I'm curious about stories. For example, like in Marseille, where you have the um, Mistral, uh, which drives people to madness, and you can use it as it's been used as a defense in court. You know, for certain crimes which have been committed during the Mistral, because the sense of imbalance and instability also infects the kind of psychological condition. For instance, wow. um, uh, yeah. So I think that there are many. Um, these are the ways in which I'd like to work with the body. Uh, one relating to Venice in particular, and it's um, and uh, conversations with Craig that I've already brought up. Uh, we've spoken about uh, early concepts of medicine and how uh, in relationship to air. And oftentimes, it was thought that uh, if you were to be able to change that, many um, uh, infectious bacteria, uh, many, many, well, they didn't have a sense of bacteria, let's say, but many uh, maladies were carried by the wind. And if you were to be able to change the smell of the wind, then you were to, you could change the quality of it and uh, make it more or make it less uh, harmful, let's say. This is also wh why the plague doctors had these large beak-like masks, because those are full of spices and, and how this might also relate to um, the, the spice trade, which was moving through Venice as well, heavily during that time. So all of a sudden you have this very rich 
rich intersections. So these are some of the things that I've been thinking about. I, I would like to kind of um, decentralize the role of vision because even as an artist when you're making like sculptures, or for instance, you're still, uh, it's still experienced primarily visually. And um, I think like, I'm often jealous of, of architecture and architects often am more, more inspired by that than uh, or feel more excited when I'm in a compelling work of architecture because this is experienced with in, in such uh, well in a, just a more immersive sense than uh, what happens uh, oftentimes at museums and galleries also following the conventions for how work is presented as well uh, um, but I th yeah I thought I, w I wanted to speak with you maybe about this uh, sense of the vestibular and the sense of orientation and how you how you maintain that and and how you might and how do you bring that? Because I, I imagine or I have a sense that it might be very different at different depths also and underwater. Um, and then how do you bring it to the surface? Because there's such a different condition inside the water than, than let's say, uh, outside where the rest of us are. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, thinking about that, I mean, sound travels completely differently underwater, so it travels a lot faster. But also the way that we hear is through our bones rather than through air. So because mm. water fills all of our cavities, it, you actually hear through the bone and we it's much more hard to um, locate ourselves, to orientate ourselves underwater. So that's one of the big senses that completely shifts when we're underwater, which is really interesting, is that you can hear a boat that sounds like it's just about to kind of come over your head, but it's actually a few miles off. So it's, you know, that your sense of orientation and balance is completely, you know, at sea, which is really, um, really interesting and really um, helps, I think, think about, I mean, I guess what's, you know, you, you were saying about how ocular centric we are and wanting to kind of move away from that. And again, being in water, that's, it's a space where like, unless we have a mask on, um, you know, sight's completely redundant and you rely on your other senses like touch and sound very much. So there is, yeah, very much things that I'm interested in and, and how, how that shifts our relationship with our body, our orientation in space, how we experience space um, when, when we're in this different space. And I guess thinking about how that relates, it's, it's more using that uh, experience as a way of reflecting on us in every day or us, us in kind of normal life um, uh, yeah as an experience so when there's such a dramatic shift of things that are often really subconscious we don't really think about you know the way that we navigate space it's not a kind of conscious unless you're an architect or studying it you know they're not conscious um, things that we think about but we, we're using all the time and I guess that's something that really interests me and and what you just said about architecture is um, do you know the uh, Yohani Palasma, there's uh, Architecture in the Senses, is a really, really beautiful book. Uh, and he talks about how when we enter a space, we understand it son sonically, our sonic experience of that space happens before we've even looked around. But again, it's something very subconscious. So we already know if you think about walking into a, a church or a stone building, that sonic experience, like, is we immediately know that space. Uh, before we've we've kind of thought or our eyes have kind of gone around it so that's something uh, in, in I don't know I just wanted to kind of mention it I guess mm -hmm. just thinking about that in terms of, of spaces and and actually how important sound is in our way of understanding them but mm -hmm. we don't I guess it's about like our, how much we think about um, or you know um, yeah how much we think about it how conscious these kind of um, mm -hmm. connections are this is a this is a piece here that I I produced in a wind tunnel at the Van Karman Institute for Fluid Dynamics, and it's their largest wind tunnel. And I wanted to create a wind using sound instead of using um, using the huge fan blades which are behind it. So I worked with some physicists, and sound is being emitted from each of the six speakers in a kind of clockwise motion. So the sound is coming um, in and out of phase with one another. So it kind of creates this corkscrewing effect down the length of the tunnel. Um, and it's, it's creating something called an acoustic vortex. So when, you're, when you put your head in the center, you, um, you don't hear any sound at all because the center of every vortex is empty versus when you put your head on the, uh, towards the edges, then suddenly uh, uh, you hear quite a bit of sound. And, and 
what was interesting for me in relationship to what you were saying is like also thinking about architectures which are not really meant or or built for human occupation in a sense yeah. but architectures which are built to to house rather than humans but house uh house fluids and the movement of fluids um so when i looked at uh, i think like the cylinder of the pool that you worked with in padua it's maybe a similar architecture but sort of vertically inverted uh um, yeah and, uh, as well and yeah yeah it, it, yeah it, no fascinating there's a piece that i made a long time ago now called resonance where um just thinking about sound and moving in architectural spaces where it was a site specific piece in in this regency basement and um i worked with a sound artist then and um we found the we went through the, the spectrum of sine waves and found the frequencies that resonated with the building itself and then he composed um uh, a piece of music or a, a piece out of these sine waves um and then i ha i had this video projection of this really interesting uh underwater space that was um it basically looked like a human-sized fish bowl in a way it's one of those natural pools um so it was meant for for humans to inhabit but it it was it looked really wild um but um yeah it was just really interesting using those the frequencies that were very much in attune with the space and how that affected the way uh you experienced the the image so the idea was that the image ex extended the architectural space so the way that we projected it it felt like it extended the space and then the sounds affected the way that you observe the image really because there was very very high frequencies and very low frequencies which it was kind of by chance um what are the frequencies that you really hear when you're underwater because again our frequency rate what we can hear changes when we're underwater so yeah. again yeah there's just really interesting kind of synergies there in those two pieces what is the role of collaboration in your artistic practice do you want to start on this one, Hasee? Sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, I find collaboration kind of like a funny, uh, it, it's often funny because I, I'm often looking for another term beyond collaboration because I find it a bit of an awkward fit uh, in a sense that it sort of doesn't, it's hard to address the, the specificity of the role that different people are playing when they contribute to, to a work. Um, and sometimes like kind of uh, equally flat footed is uh, when I say uh, oftentimes an easy way to explain this work is a transdisciplinary collaboration or art and science collaboration, but it's not necessarily a collaboration between art per se and science per se. It's really a collaboration between two people who are um, have a, a lot of curiosity that uh, see within their disciplines that there is a uh, something which is lacking and something that could be completed uh, through an engagement with somebody else who's working in a different modality within the constraints of a different discipline. Um, so it's really oftentimes like this, like a desire for freedom, which is uh, it's, uh, motivating um, a collaboration or a, a work um, rather than a attempt to um, rather than an attempt to kind of in a da Vinci style uh, recover some lost uh, um, holistic quality of knowledge itself or something like this, which is also often how I hear it's explained. But I mean, uh, for instance, I've worked um, for the last five or six years with uh, Professor Olivier Chazot, who's the director of the aerospace uh, department at, at Von Karman. And he is um, also a phenomenologist and a philosopher. And for him, our engagements have offered um, ways of addressing uh, some of the, the limitations on the necessary limitations of scientific method uh, because, and it's also helped me to realize something interesting about the way we think about science, which is, uh, um, I, I don't think it was ever intended to be like the dominant form of knowledge production. It's just, a, it's a highly specific one, but there's something about uh, the character and or the turn that our society has taken that seen that sees it as uh, as the only form of legitimate or objective knowledge production itself. You know, um, uh, our notion of truth maybe is much more limited than than it had been in the past. For instance, that there's only that truth can only come from 
verifiable experiments, for instance, you know, um, and is, is uh, defined, uh, has one definition oftentimes until that's overturned, let's say. So uh, these are the way that the collaborations have happened. But what's also interesting for me is in the artworks that they're a record of, I'd like the artworks, I feel like they have multiple audiences. And the first audience is the people who have helped to produce the work. And what I'd like is for those people to be able to look back on the work and see it as the record of the uh, of the interaction and the conversations and the engagement that we've had uh, um, as sort of collaborating or uh, sorry uh, as providing something essential and that kind of materiality as well. So um, yeah, that's uh, and that's also why I try to bring unlikely uh, uh, pairings together in the work as well. So sound artists and physicists or florists and uh, aeronautical engineers and so, so on. Uh, these kinds of things that might not happen otherwise in our increasingly kind of atomized uh, society. Yeah, interesting. Um, I, th I think I'm, yeah, it's really sort of similar thinking in, in the fact that I think, I mean, for me, my work is fundamentally collaborative in the sense that I work with lots of different me people when I'm make up, you know, working on a project. And in a sense, we're just, we're all researching in, in different ways. Everyone's sort of researching. Um, and, uh, and it varies massively, like the, the collaboration or the, the role of collaboration varies massively depending on the project. So I don't think there is one, one way of collaborating. Collaboration can mean, to me anyway, can mean a, a huge, um, variety of, of different ways of working um, so I, I finished a film last year called Common Heritage which is about um, the gold rush of, of deep sea mining for rare earth minerals and it, for that film I worked with lots of different scientists because it's a very um, it's a subject that's um, developing rapidly at the moment so it's the the mining hasn't started happening for rare earth minerals yet but laws are being drawn up at the moment it's literally kind of very very imminent and happening at the moment so i had a few i worked with a few key scientists who are uh, who've you know dived to the depths who are really kind of trying and working on on this uh, law of the sea to try and have this internationally binding agreement so i really need to just stay on top of the subject matter as well as learn about the huge history that came before it and I've um, worked with a lot of the footage that they'd recovered um, from diving in the deep. So it was, it was, I guess it was more on a consultation level in that sense. It was a lot of conversations, but it was, um, it was about learning and understanding and keeping on top of, of, um, of the subject. And then another project, The Space Below, which is a collaboration in itself with another artist, a sound artist called Lee Berwick. So that's, you know, two artists working equally on that project um, and that was yeah a, a sound into the installation that happened at the beginning of the year about underwater sound pollution and the work itself was made from um, an archive of sounds that we collected from sound recorders around the globe so again the project itself is a collaboration that's how you know we've seen it as a, as a collaboration across many people globally and there's the a website that we've built that's in a very kind of uh, primary stage but that itself hosts this collection of sounds and research um, that is like the backbone of the project so um, yeah that you know already in there there's like lots of different ways of, of kind of working with people but also mm. like I kind of spoke about before and, and like you were talking about it like in the making of the work itself um, when I work with people particularly it's a real um, that is a, a real process that's really valuable and the conversations that I have with people as the work is evolving that very much feeds into the work so I see that as a collaboration as well. What is the role of the artist? I think with thinking about my my process my working process there's a real ebb and flow of collaborating a lot of conversations a lot of uh, yeah a lot of talking reading working with people and then i need to have space to pull back and reflect and think for myself and that happens um throughout in different ways so um it can collaboration is really exciting and, and but it can also be quite a dense and noisy space and it's really important for me 
to pull back and then really think, okay, so what do I think, what do I really think about that and what's important to me and, and what's going to drive or which direction do I want this, this work to kind of move in. So I think to me, that's, that's the, the role of the artist and, and definitely, you know, at the end, it, it's kind of, it's your vision, but it's in, involved a lot of people, a lot of conversations. So it's, it's a, it's a group effort, but it's, but it is also um, at the end of the day, it's, it is your, if you're working in that way, so, but it is, you know, your, the, the ideas that you feel are the most important and you want to drive through and, and your vision. Yeah, I think that that's really important. Um, the, the aspect of vision is super important because uh, somehow everybody who's working on the project, they're, they're, they're working on a specific aspect of it, but there's some sense of trust uh, that everybody has in the fact that this work is going somewhere and that each of these parts are sort of contributing to a whole. Um, and so you're, you, you still, that's, that's often what I feel like I'm providing also is a, even though I'm constantly adjusting and adapting the, the work to the material that's being introduced and, the, and trying to keep it open as possible. But at the same time, um, as you mentioned, it requires this constant kind of reflexive um, uh, process because you have to provide that sense of direction and sense of trust and, and, and maintain it for, for everybody involved. And so like uh, when you collaborate as an artist, I, at least for me, I often get so fascinated by the work that other people are doing, but it can be a bit of a slippery slope because uh, uh, at the same time, you cannot just completely fade into the background. You still need to maintain like uh, the structure of the entire project uh, and, what makes it necessary also by the kind of situation of it within society and within um, artistic production or scientific production itself is that you have to maintain that centralized role. So uh, yeah, that's, I think that's important. Um, I, I think that what's interesting is the role of the studio in that sense too. Like I still maintain a studio uh, and in a way you would think that it might be unnecessary, like, uh, there was a lot of discussion and discourse of, of post-studio practices, but it's interesting that even though I find that this is maybe more of a research-based artistic practice or maybe more moving away from convention conventions of artistic production, at the same time, the role of the studio is still important, but in a different way mm -hmm. as, a, as a space of uh, reflection, as a space of reintegration, as a, and also as a private space, because uh, you are indeed exposed to so much uh, information and so many people that <laughs> it's yeah definitely and I've, I've definitely found that with this project actually because there's been so much information I found it actually quite hard when I was in, in Venice pulling back and thinking creatively because there was just there was so much and it's really great to have had this space and and you know had, had my studio to kind of to to be able to think in a different way because you can just get so involved like you're saying and taken down that path that you're just kind of you're thinking you know you're, you're yeah thinking having a lot of conversations but they're not necessarily creative they're just kind of exploring the the um the subject itself and kind of finding connections which is creative but it's not necessarily thinking about it in a as an artwork it's just thinking about it in in terms of like yeah drawing finding connections and uh finding out exciting things and what you're interested in but actually to then draw back and, and respond is is difficult sometimes. Ariana told me that uh, you just become a mother, um, and uh, I was curious about how uh, your experience of diving because I was I'd been I'd worked on a project called, called the Wind Egg related to um, mythologies of wind fertilization of animals and people. Um, yeah, um, like for example the the notion of the Immaculate Conception. And, and I was curious about this experience of diving and the experience of um, essentially developing within, as a fetus within this kind of amniotic fluid itself. And uh, I was wondering if somehow this experience um, gave you insight into your work or because we're kind of born into this fluidity and even when babies are, uh, I mean, they're, they're breathing fluid in and out of their lungs, uh, um, and we kind of make this switch to breathing uh, air or oxygen. Um, and I wonder like, well, your work is sort of 
in some ways you're, it's based within the water. And that's what I found so compelling is that some of the photographs I was looking at also where there's very subtle shifts where you can realize that in fact, this is this scene is taking place within, uh, is staged uh, underwater as well. And uh, yeah, I wanted to know if somehow this experience has provided new insights into your work or on the other hand, like uh, this kind of primordial state of, of being like of fluid or being born in fluid in that sense. So. Interesting. Yeah, I guess, if I think about this, I think, I guess, I mean, being pregnant itself, you're carrying around this water, this kind of, this amniotic fluid, but that, you know, that in itself, I, I really, this is very off the cuff, I haven't thought about this properly, but, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, think, thinking about the, yeah, your body expands and you physically are carrying a lot more water, a lot more fluid, and, it, and it's a world, it's a, it's a habitat within itself that is just incredible. I mean, the way that one's body changes is, is just incredible and completely, yeah, fascinated me throughout the whole process because um, it's just incredible what, you know, what nature does. And I think that, that has been a, a, a big thing, big part of the experience is how incredible nature is and the amount of things that happen that are just, you know, without you consciously even knowing that, it, you know, that, that are just happening with inside you and the, about the fact that you've created this habitat for a being to be able to grow inside is itself incredible and it's a very yeah physiological physical experience as well as being um you know something that's conceptually very interesting but it's very yeah you're very much aware um of your body and this other this other being inside it so I, yeah i guess creating that habitat is amazing and then when they come out of that, the, the primal, the primalness of, of the experience is, is really incredible as well. Um, and, and it's quite interesting because I, I guess for a long time when people have, have said, uh, oh, you work in water, of course, we will, you know, life starts in water. And I've, it's kind of something you hear quite a lot when you talk about water and I'm just kind of like, yeah, yeah. So, but I want to move beyond that in my work. I want to kind of like think about it as this alternative space. And that's really important that you don't, you know, in the work, in some of the work that you don't know at the beginning that it is water, but you just know that it's a different space. And then it takes a while to work out what space they're in. Um, and so I've kind of I almost resist it in the sense that it's like, yes, I know we we you know life begins in water blah 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 but actually having that experience myself going through that and then creating a life in this this habitat that is my own body um has made me realize how incredible that is and how primal that is and um it yeah i'm not sure whether it's informed my work yet but um i have not been making a huge amount of work i've been thinking but not not making but but i imagine i imagine it will do because it's such a complete transformation of of one's body um that i'm i'm sure it will uh, even if it's a, on a subconscious level at the beginning um yeah i'm not sure whether that entirely answers your question but um but it's, it's definitely Reson is something that really resonates and you can't experience, you know, it's that the, the changes that your body goes through is just absolutely incredible. And the fact that it can create uh, a being, <laughs> you know, in itself is quite nuts. Yeah. It's also interesting that you had said that like you, people had brought this association previously, but then, um, but you had wanted to say that, well, this is a completely other alternative space. Uh, whereas posing it as a, a return to a, a space which had already existed. Um, yeah. I mean, I can see how that also like kind of changes the epistemology of your work or the situation of your work in a sense, like, is it something else or other, or is it something that's a return? And um, yeah, and it's, I'm curious about how that might, um, how your thoughts about that develop over time. Yeah, I, I think there's like, I mean, what's, what's brilliant about water is this, we've all got a connection with it and it evokes a huge extreme range of emotions in people from absolute fear to complete tranquility. You know, people give birth in water because it's such a tranquil space. But for some people they have, like my dad has an absolute, he's terrified of water. Um, 
so it, so that's what's incredible about it as a medium is on some level we all relate to it and i'm sure that's because we all started in, in water so there is that i think that is i think that is there um but i guess it was kind of it's wanting to kind of think beyond that as well but i but i do think that is is that it's innate in the medium itself mm. yeah thanks <laughs> Thinking about the climate crisis we're in and the conversations you must have had with different people about wind over a long period of time, um, especially as you've looked into kind of the history of wind, cultural relationships, um, thinking about wind. What are your thoughts on the current human relationship with wind? I, I think it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, I'd, I'd done this like a uh, project called uh, a wind avatar where I created a turbulence pattern within a, within a wind tunnel that renders the face of the wind uh, or a turbulence pattern that looks like a face. And for me, this was interesting because it relates to uh, uh, this cognitive bias where you kind of anthropomorphize or project faces into nature. Um, and I started to think from that point also, like, is it, uh, I started to think from that point, uh, is this, is this, um, this confrontation with an other, uh, but is it can be really considered as something other at this point because it's we're living in the moment of the Anthropocene. So uh, there is a socialization of nature which is nearing its kind of completeness in a sense, uh, or are, are we at, at least have to acknowledge it in order to maintain something of nature. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's something. Uh, I often find that we the only way we can find ways of relating to nature is to ascribe um, a sense of agency to it similar to um, similar to the type of agency that we have. So uh, there's often this question, do things like rocks have consciousness, you know, like pen, pen yeah. consciousness and so on. Yeah. And uh, I find it like on the one hand, like, or Gaia theory as well. And these things are they're very compelling and interesting, but it's, um, difficult to uh, uh it's it's still like doesn't really stretch the framework that uh, that we sort of are um, superimposing onto the natural environment in my in my sense and uh, i wonder about um how far the discourse of the anthropocene can really get us in that sense like uh because maybe what we end up with is um a feeling that society or the anthro that we as the anthro in a sense are are uh, too monolithic to really understand ourselves, so we can't really understand the impact we have uh, on nature uh, or on the rest of the environment. Let's say um, so. It, it kind of is a sense of kind of estrangement from even our own social being, which which I think it's actually intended to. Uh, it's actually intended to have the opposite effect. But I often see that it kind of demobilizes people in this sense uh, uh, as well, like rather than encouraging people to try to bring bring the impact, the human impact on the environment to grasp, into grasp. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, these are questions, but it's, it's interesting that it's like um, the shifting in the weather patterns and wind patterns uh, have, uh, you you can start to look at them as a kind of uh, almost with a forensic sensibility like is this because of um, a change in climate or not or is this because of just the unpredictability of the wind itself and I actually kind of like that it uh, still res it, it's still hard to know concretely or definitely there's still the chaotic and turbulent nature of wind that's maintained which maybe keeps us on our toes <laughs> keeps us questioning and wondering in that sense which I think is necessary like we, we I don't think that there's a, a complete understanding really possible so there has to be an open um, approach in that sense. Do you think do you think we need to change the way we think about wind? I think I think that like uh, there it's interesting when I look at the early associations if you look at like uh, mythologies and um, when you look at uh, creation mythologies and, and the role that it plays in early religious texts or spiritual text there wasn't really uh, there wasn't literature proper in the pre-modern period as we know it now of course uh, but the the way in which it's talked about in those in many of those texts is wind and 
is associated with breath, is associated with soul and creation. And when you then look at the associations that wind have in the kind of uh, modern period, it's often associated with uh, fear, uncertainty, instability, chaos, which is often always uh, uh, understood as in a negative sense. Um, and it also, like in previous times, it had this relationship with, uh, with time and like Kairos uh, or Fortuna, this, this uh, notion that uh, the, the right winds will, bro will blow, that the, that the opportune time will come, uh, which I think is a really interesting moment or understanding of time that things sort of fall into alignment in a certain way uh, that allow for something to happen. And probably this comes from like a nautical sensibility, which we're a little bit uh, uh, divorced from now. Um, but I wonder if this is something that we can uh, reintroduce is uh, maybe thinking about time in a different way uh, rather than this kind of strict linear sense that keeps on being kind of reinforced. Um, mm. So, and I think the kind of chaotic nature of wind, which is always unpredictable, sort of disrupts this notion of time as a linear construction in that, yeah. in that regard. And we come back to like the Greek kairos uh, yeah. in that sense. Yeah. I have a question though in that regard, because I often see people associating um, water with memory. And this is something yeah. that I've never quite understood, like why, like saying that water has a memory, but, yeah. uh, and I've seen some artworks on this subject as well. And I think it relates to um, traditions in, that come from Africa, at least that's how it was presented in these artworks. I don't, I didn't, um, I don't have the citation offhand, but uh, do you, could you, are you familiar with this relationship of water and memory or can you relate to that at all or, or know why it's associated? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've looked into it a bit in terms of um, the, the, there's um, a Japanese, he's not a scientist, but there was, there was somebody that, um, that looked into the, yeah, the structure of, of uh, crystals, water crystals. And if you, um, uh, yeah, you project certain emotions onto, onto water and then you kind of look at it on a microscopic level, it responds uh in a certain formation that is uh the same across that body of water but then if you you look at another body of water and give it a different emotion then it, it kind of makes formations in a different way um so and yeah i was quite fascinated i, I kind of was looking at that in a, in a project i was doing in singapore years ago now um and there is yeah there's there's quite a lot of um thinking about yeah water being able to hold old memories in in that sense that it's it's something that I guess it's thinking about again it, it's it's not in our kind of western scientific way of thinking but it is very much the fact that thinking about it as an animate body and and it responding to to our body um is is how I I think about that I guess and 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 yeah us having this this um effect on on the, the elements that we're immersed in um dr emoto is the is the guy that i was looking into um yeah and it's it's quite an interesting you know there's this this controversy around how scientific you know his experiments are but um but it but to me it, yeah it was it's very it's a very interesting way, way of thinking that there was this kind of um yeah f physical response that one could see from from these emotions that are projected onto the water i guess again thinking about the the situation, the climate crisis we're in at the moment, um, to me, it feels like we've got to make some deeply entrenched behavioural and structural changes. Um, and there's some really, really critical science that we need to know about um, that can help navigate our way into this very uncertain future that we've got uh, ahead of us. Um, and I think art particularly um, can stimulate ways of thinking conceptually and analytically about science from an experiential position. It's kind of, this is, I guess, the way the, what I think art can bring. So art allows um, people, us to experience um, and imagine uh, possible futures and, ha and have an emotional response. Um, and, I, and I think these are all um, elements that are really critical in understanding kind of quite complex subjects so they're not necessarily a kind of uh, a, an analytical cerebral response but it's actually a response on a much more um, uh, yeah 
emotional level that, that is to, to me I, I think it's really under important in as a way of understanding and I think um, we need to be able to imagine different futures I think that's a really we're so entrenched in this this kind of way of living at the moment and uh, it feels really hard for us to be able to imagine different futures and I think again that's like art can work with science in, in helping to imagine uh, these different futures which again I think is really important in in being able to instigate change is once one once you can imagine and you can think then you can start to enact um, and, and inhabit that change. One of the fundamental definitions of what an artwork is which I, I like that it still remains like sort of a controversial question is that uh, it's uh, an artwork can can be uh, uh, more than one thing at the same time uh, so it's and it has this kind of unique capacity to uh, to be more than one thing simultaneously, even if it's two contradictory things. Um, uh, and also that the intention of the creator is not necessarily, uh, um, ha is not necessarily the primary or uh, maintains the authority of the work, even over time. And I think that this is um, something, a uh, quality of an artwork that can be lent to oftentimes uh, the deterministic conditions in which scientific uh, research um, and even humanities or social sciences research is often conducted, which I think has a lot to do with uh, funding structures and grant granting um, bodies, which uh, ask you to deliver precisely what you say you will deliver when you write the grant, regardless of what you've uncovered in the process of having conducted the research, uh, which, which uh, can happen at least. Um, so this is, uh, I think this is one, one thing that the artwork allows for is like, um, maintaining, maintaining seemingly contradictory positions and keeping them in tension, which I think is very important, uh, because, uh, what I experience often socially, politically, and also within a research or academic context that the, the room for nuance and the room for contradiction and antinomy is like uh, consistently eroded. Um, yeah, because I often find it, I, I, maybe it's like a sort of dialectical mode of thinking where I think that while the true, the insight relies on, in, uh, bringing together the op opposition of two things, um, uh, rather than in one or the other. Um, and moreover, I think that the way that, uh, the more that, uh, research progresses, uh, the, the more specialization it demands. Um, and which which allows for um, greater amounts of progress, let's say, development of knowledge uh, that's very specialized, but it also produces a kind of atomization. And I think uh, artists and artworks, and it's not necessarily that all artists work in this way, but it, it there is a certain capacity in which uh, um, we can... Um, uh, bring together people from multiple disciplines under one uh, new framework of production in that sense. Uh, so the artist, uh, to borrow a term from Maria Kialova from Bach in, in Utrecht, she describes the artist also as a convener. And I, I kind of like this term of artist as convener in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I was, I was actually going to add to add to that point exactly that, that I think um, complexity is really important. Um, and this this multidisciplinary approach, and that's what art is really good at, at doing. I think is is drawing connections between disciplines. So um, not only thinking about the complexity within science itself, but also what does it mean in history? What does it mean in terms of politics, class, economics? Like just kind of drawing from from all the different disciplines, um, which creates yeah a, a richness of understanding about a particular uh, subject matter. And it's also a way of, of processing information. Um, everybody processes information in different ways. And again, that allows for, that, for those nuances that you're talking about and, and the complexities. Um, that are just, that's just, just really important. And I, I think there's also like a strange way in which like uh, authorship 
even though it was declared dead a long time ago like maybe well it did it, it's sort of like an incomplete like uh, death of the artist or authorship let's say but in this sense like it might uh, offer something in this kind of strange way it's just a thought that i've had recently because um oftentimes we see technology and m many a lot of research conducted very anonymously um uh, and what authorship might offer is a sense of um of intentionality uh, in this sense that we it might reflect on, for example, techno technological development as a form of, of wish fulfillment, the same way that authorship offers uh, is like a, a desire which is um, being, being realized in one way or another, materialized in one way or another. Um, and maybe it helps to kind of break us out of this kind of feeling of anonymity that we have uh, in a kind of this more and more feeling monolithic society, let's say, which is more integrated, but also more anonymous. It's just the sense that I have. Uh, um, so, yeah, I wonder if um, if this is uh, something that, that it also offers in that sense. Uh, Thank you very much, Hasib Ahmed, who is sky, and Emma Critchley, who is water. Uh, two of the artists in residence for Science Gallery Venice. Thank you for being here.